So we are live now. Can you check the Ritu on YouTube? I mean, if you there are people there. So should we start? Yes, we yes, yes. we are live. Okay. So uh on behalf of uh, Society for Bacteriophage Research and Therapy India, I, Taruna Anand, uh, working as senior scientist in National Research Center on Equines at Hisar, Haryana, welcome you for the third webinar, which is being uh, organized as a part of webinar series by Society for Bacteriophage Research and Therapy. This society was uh, established in year uh, 2016, and uh, it aims at joining together the researchers who are working on bacteriophages exclusively. Uh, right now, we are dealing with the uh, Indian bacteriophage researchers, and uh, we have had uh, we have had uh, uh, one international conference also, and uh, uh, as an initiative to uh, promote the bacteriophage research we are conducting these webinars to join the experts from abroad. So uh, in this, in this uh, first of all, I would request Dr. Sanjay Chibber, who is the president of Society for Bacteriophage Research and Therapy, to, uh, uh, to propose an in, uh, introductory note about SBRT, and then welcome our keynote speaker, Professor B. N. Tripathi, who is currently DDG Animal Science at ICR headquarters. Sir, please. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Um, the Society for Bacteriophage Research and Therapy was constituted almost two years back. Um, it is actively uh, working to promote uh, phage research, bacteriophage research in India. And uh, as uh, you have been told that the international conference was also organized in 2019. And uh, we are uh, organizing now the webinars uh, in order to have the experts on this particular uh, topic from India and abroad. And today it is the third webinar which is being organized. And I am very happy to welcome our keynote speaker, Dr. Bhupendra Nath Ripati, who is Deputy Director General Animal Sciences, Indian Council of Agricultural Research, New Delhi. Uh, Dr. Tripathi has earlier been the Director, ICAR National Research Center on Equines and Project Coordinator, National Center for Veterinary Type Culture at NRC Hisar. He has also been Director, CCS National Institute of Animal Health, Bagpat, Government of India, Ministry of Agriculture, uh, Department of Animal has been re. Uh, he has also been head division of animal health at the ICAR Central Sheep and Wool Research Institute and at ICAR IVRI as principal scientist and scientist. Uh, he did his uh, PhD in the year 1990 from IVRI Izzat Nagar and then he is member of a number of uh, uh, societies uh, and the um, he has also overseas attachments from 1998 to 1919. He was visiting scientist at the Institute for Animal Health, UK Molecular Biology and Pathogenesis. And from 2003 to 2004, visiting scientist at Edinburgh, UK. At present, his position, he is, this is the highest position in the veterinary and animal sciences in India, guiding and leading 19 institutes of ICR and state agricultural veterinary universities for research and technology development for suitable livestock and poultry production in India. The DDG AS works in tandem with Government of India, Ministry of Fisheries, Animal Husbandry, and Dairy for, uh, Daring for Disease Control and Eradication, and other policy decisions on animal husbandry issues. The DDG AS also coordinates with the Indian Council of Medical Research, that is ICMR, and Department of Health Research, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, on one health issues, 
such as antimicrobial resistance, that is AMR, and zoonotic diseases. He has published more than 150 research papers, 13 reviews, um, which have got good citation. Uh, he has written five books, seven manuals completed, 12 back book chapters, and proceedings of the conferences at sir. So with this introduction, I uh, invite our keynote speaker to deliver his lecture. Dr. Tripathi, please. Uh, thank you, Professor Chibar. It's, uh, I'm very, very glad to, uh, to attend this uh, webinar. So Dr. Tona has been asking me to attend earlier ones she organized. But this time, she could uh, really attach me. So I'll have to come. So, okay, okay, I, I said that I will I will take out some time. I will not keep up any meeting with this. So, friends, uh, our society is uh, very new, very new. Just two years back, when we met at Minichu, Varanasi, during an international conference on Bacteriophage, organized by Professor Gopal Nath, then there, and all stalwarts in back of us work, like Professor Chipper and many others at BHU and other places uh, from South India also. They all come up with a, we thought that there must be society. If you want really to, to, to enhance the science of back of us in this country, and, uh, and it's particularly transcendental research on back of us that it can be helpful to humankind, mankind, and animal kind, then we have to have a society so that we can exchange our knowledge, our views regarding bacteriophages and its therapy and other many, other many applications of bacteriophages. In the country, at uh, our National Center for Veterinary Type Cultures, we had a bacteriophage repository that now host to more than 170 bacteriophages. And, and then um, we thought that uh, research on fast therapy, so really still, still we have a lot to do on this aspect. So with this, uh, this is just a work enough for this uh, uh, society that we were able to uh, take about two years back, we only started with members. So I welcome, I am also a member of this uh, society, the Kripalja Research and Therapy Society. So I welcome uh, our, our lead speaker, Dr. Dr. Julian. Julian Gross from USA. I, I was told that this is, is a leading, leading scientist on bacteriophages. And perhaps this is third, she's so going to, to tell us about uh, very, I mean, topic is very, very unique, knowing, knowing the unknown. Approaches to characterize the uncharacterized proteome of bacteriophages. So that's a wonderful topic. Really, we, we know very, very small thing about bacteriophages. And, and, and therefore, today, today our topic is very important. I also welcome the president of society, Professor Chibber. And uh, I got no home, Dr. Urmi, and two gentle ladies. She was really doing a lot, Dr. Kalma and Dr. Urmi. They have been really, you know, the focus of our you know, society. They always, always keep alive and arranging uh, and webinars and the meetings, etc. And she was really active, uh, all scientists active in this. When, when we were given this, uh, the second conference was organized at, uh, at Hisar, which we could not do. But we end up with organizing a workshop and uh, with, with the help of uh, ICMR. So, so we, we sent in a proposal for, for, a, for a conference and we were given only 50,000 rupees for, for, the, for the conference. So we thought better to have uh, the workshop. They suggested us for the workshop. And then again, I wrote back to them, what we, what we do with the 50,000? So they give another 50,000. <laughs> so we thought they let organize it. And this workshop was so successful. And many experts like Professor Chipper, Professor Gopalnath, and Dr. Urmi, the whole 
came there. And almost twenty five to thirty young graduates they are they participated. And I thought it was it was the beginning. And I suppose that the, the kind of training in three four days that they got from Hisar, they must be working now in their life. And uh, they must be in touch with Dr. Krona and Dr. Urmi and many other people uh, who are really greatly actively working on on, on the macrophage. Friends, today. I was, I was just uh, uh, thinking that uh, what to speak on this occasion. Uh, only that because it is such a, such a diverse area, you know, and everywhere is the largest number of, of any kind, you know, in, including bacteria. More than 10 to 31 uh, bacteriophages are there in, in, on, on this earth, on this planet. And how much do we know? If we classify them, we find them only about 11 orders. As some are unclassified yet, around 2020, 2022 families of macrophages and a different kind of that. So, so friends, they are, they, are, they are very unique ones, and they, they really, and the, and, the, and the very happy situation is that for all of us, that macrophage origin, its research started from India in the, in the, in the end of 19th century, when uh, when, a, when a scientist uh, uh, called Ernest Henry Hankin. That there was something in the Ganges and uh, and uh, and the Jamuna River water, and a certain uh, certain certain uh, antibacterial property, especially they could see against cholera. Why 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 people people uh, near near Ganges and the river to dip? From the Hindu family, they used to throw their human bodies in the Ganges River, especially those who were affected with cholera. Not for others. You know. Now, now we don't. Eat. They have got that cremation, etc. So they, they thought that, and and they, they collected water, water around around that dead that body, and they found that it was quite sterile. So so people knew since very I mean very I mean ancient time that in Ganges water had got something in, in it. It has got this this property, and that is why we never found. In this water, Jumna water, that is rotten or putrefied, never. So that is that is the origin of the research. And then further, when a, a, a British bacteriologist, uh, which is Frederick Toyd, he discovered that that uh, there's something some, some something small microbe that is in bacteria. Now then, the the major work start with the in 19 you know, early 20th century, 1917. When Frederick, uh, this uh, Felix Beherer, he was a French and Canadian microbiologist at, at Pasteur Institute, then he then he treated patient patient with bacteriophage with a dysentery, uh, the patient should be from dysentery. So so that was the start, and that time in those times there were no antibiotics, so they were they were I mean, in in the Russian Russian country, Soviet Union and, and East European countries. It was it was a kind of therapy that was going on, but 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 not, not much research could be done on this because this is not this is not a molecule that you give and to bacteria. It has got the live it is a live virus, and once it goes in, inside the body, it may cause certain many other things and how to how to how to uh, fix those there's so problems with them. And then in 1945, when the antibiotics I mean the penicillin were discovered. Then and they found the penicillin to be very, very, I mean, simple, very simple organic, a simple a molecule that can be used better than bacteriophage. So bacteriophage research could not could not go, go, could not take a greater depth with that with the advent of uh, advent of this um, antibiotic, you know, penicillin, etc. But the discovery of uh, antibiotic, they very clearly Force are this that that this anti this bacteria may may become resistant to this, this uh, antibiotic in, in future, and they really warn us. They really warn us in those times itself. Now we are seeing it. <coughs> now we are seeing that how antimicrobial resistance is now one of the most important agenda item. On the, on, with, on, with, with the WHO, with FAO, with OIE, and, and there, therefore, now we can realize it. Now we are looking for alternative therapy. 
And then people will start thinking about vectorfly. And the first experiment, it is said that it was done only in 2009 in the USA and other countries, where even, even USFDA and USDA they allowed this experiment. And also, they saw that vectorfly therapy can be very effective in some of the some of very uh, uh, diseases where MDR be affected by MDR. We are bacteria, but still we have to go a long way. We still have to go a long way, and uh, we have to go for the therapy. <coughs> I was discussing with Tarna that that how we can really one of the experiment that we did with with our Priscilla um, pneumonia perhaps. And we found a very encouraging result. And, and the Vinod Kumar from, from Karnataka and Professor Chibber, they have all been doing and try to decide. Decide. Uh, it's, it's a main main aspect, especially the doses and uh, with intervals and uh, what, what should be the titers. But I was always stressing upon that since it is a live virus, it goes inside, then why not we should read if, if, if it studies immunology? What is going inside? Can't see if you go on going repeatedly, there might be resistance also. If the virus is going inside, there must be antibody production also. And once you go for the repeated and chronic uh, treatment of chronic uh, bacterial diseases in such cases, then will that uh, bacterial heart therapy be effective or not? So that was the question. So there are many questions that still we have to answer. And perhaps uh, those people who are working currently will be able to, to get some answer out of it. <coughs> now, once once we are going to use as a excuse me. <coughs> so once we are going to use as a therapy. <coughs> Then also we have to see that what are the implications of the immune system? What is the pharmacokinetics of this? What is the pharmacodynamics? So, so these studies should be done along with the pharmacologist also. So that we can come with, with some some solution. When we come up with any product, there is always a lot of question people raise it. So therefore, we have to see that how and how we can we can develop a Step by step, you know, uh, these these questions can answer them so that it can it can be popularized. But certainly, in case of certain certain bacterial infection, it has been found very effective from from BHU also that Gopal Nath has also been doing it and has found that how some of the some of infection he has been able to treat the patient and in the chronic wound infection he has been able to treat that. So there are there are possibility potentials are there. But but we have to we have to work on this so that uh, it can really become in, in the practice. You know, which normally people and also we have to have a, a repository, uh, a kind of bank where where, where people can can send you uh, send you demand and and we can can send it. So therefore, I always request people who are working on bacteriophages, they must submit their bacteriophages, get a fixed number. We are doing it free of cost at at UTCC Hisar. So that it can be used for posterity, for our fraternity, and it will, and it will be a great help to the human beings. Uh, friends, uh, uh, I am not to speak much on this uh, because still, uh, uh, when there are also some complaint, people say that whenever we use this factor fire, there must be adverse effect also. So we have to see that how these are adverse effects are there and what intervention we can do. Uh, so that such like I mean so many I was just reading about adverse effect of bacteriophages that we still more than 25 adverse effects. So it is possible because this is a live organism, live virus, and it go inside, it interact with the immune cells also, and uh, sometimes you know it can it can cause problem also. Therefore, uh, we have to have a general operating procedures, and at least we should start working disease by disease and try to see that every 
every problems, every questions, every queries are addressed properly, so so that it can become an alternative for some of the diseases and and antibiotic resistant. What we are saying today can be also mitigated. That is the whole issue now. I was just uh, I'm looking at uh, some of the topic that uh, earlier two two webinars that we have, we have organized. That was a wonderful topic that that was. Uh, we were talked by Dr. Toby Nagel and, and from from USA and Janet Nare uh, from UK. So uh, I'm, I'm very happy that at least uh, both uh, both country ladies have been able to to organize that and uh, bringing best people from the world. And so so that uh, <laughs> we we are all being you know uh, it kind of a stimulus for all of us to go for the better uh, for research. So with this, I'll not speak much, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm I'm really glad I tell you that uh, since uh, we we started, I, I remember I used to call I uh, tell Dr. Talma that you have to study dynamics of bacteriophage. I I have I have I have given her Ganges water many a time. I have asked her to at different intervals, at different intervals you look look into both their bacterial profile and bacteriophage profile, and see that. What is the what is the ecosystem they are they are they are being you no know, uh, being maintained for years together for several years maybe 10 years 20 years so that study should also be done when when we when we keep in this water in 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 a bottle those bottle you no know, you just keep it for 25 years nothing happen but when you collect freshly freshly today and then then you test it test it after a year. After five years, after ten years, to see what is happening there, what is happening there, how how microphage is surviving in, inside the Ganges water, if, if you know, what is the what is symbiotic, is there any symbiotic relationship between these two in a in a closed vessel, so that kind of dynamics is also so much of life on on, on such like these are some of the the researchable issue that uh, young scientists can take up. And I would always you now prefer to, to emphasize that immunology. We have to study immunology. If you should not study immunology, all those problems, all the adverse effects that are coming, they are due to immunological reaction inside the body. So we have to, to do we have to do some research on immunology also. How how this this, this virus when it enters bacteria, how it is being presented, presented to immunological immunological cells, this macrophages. In, in terms of MSC class one and class two, I mean there, there's so many signs that we still have to get, get answers of all these things. So with this, I, I thank you, Dr. Tarna, for inviting me and uh, giving me the opportunity to get with you, see you, all of you, and both though virtually, not in person, but at least I could be. And also uh, thank you, Dr. Dr. Julian Bros, that uh, she is able to make it, and uh, I suppose that she will give a very wonderful, wonderful. Uh, a seminar for the benefit of all the, our audience and uh, the students and researchers and all of us. So with this, thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for the wonderful words of motivation. And you have been motivating the bacteriophage research through being the member of the society as well as at NRCE promoting us to gather good phages and to do good science. And I am uh, I remember, sir, you told me, you gave me so many advices, which uh, some have been followed and some are yet to be followed. I will take care. And uh, uh, thank you, sir, for being here and sparing some time and motivating us. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Now I uh, request Dr. Sanjay Chibar, sir, to, uh, propose, to uh, introduce the expert, Dr. Julian Gross. Uh, kindly, sir. So please, uh, yeah, please unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? I'm uh, very happy that Dr. Chimbar is giving everywhere he always present and he's also very active on WhatsApp also. <laughs> 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 Dr. Very good, but please continue working. Thank you, Dr. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Julian Bro Gross, 
is an associate professor at Brigham Young University, where she has taught for 12 years. She has studied phage isolation and characterization for 11 years in her laboratory and as a co-instructor of the BYU phage Amthus program, where she has trained over 400 students in basic phage research. Dr. Gross has co-authored over 46 scientific manuscripts, as well as two books, chapters, 27 of which are phage articles. She has focused on phages that in fact, the Enterobacteriaceae, as well as Bacillaceae family of bacteria, where she has developed phage therapies for animals, humans, and agricultural use. She has been awarded funding from NIH, USDA, IR4, as well as several private industries. So with this introduction, I invite Dr. Gross to deliver her today's webinar. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. I hope that you can see my PowerPoint. Right, yes. Great. Perfect. So I provided a few images of Utah, where I'm from here in Utah. Right now it's the fall. We don't quite have snow yet, but we have leaves turning color and it's, it's very beautiful. Hopefully I will be able to meet some of you one day in the future. But today I'd really like to talk about knowing the unknown or, or characterizing the uncharacterized proteins of phage. I'm going to give you a background to understand why this is so important. As you are probably all aware, antibiotic resistance is growing in the world and is becoming a big problem with over almost a million cases or a million deaths per year. And this is expected, these are the projections shown here for 2050 when it's expected to actually overtake all other diseases and become the predominant disease. So clearly we need other alternatives and bacteriophages are an excellent alternative because they are specific for the type of bacteria that they infect. So here is just a, a cartoon of what might be the gut of a human or an animal. And we can see that when a pathogen comes in, pathogens outcompete healthy bacteria in our microbiome. And in this way, they cause disease and they can multiply and take over a population. We can use bacteriophage specific for that pathogen to come in and kill the pathogen and restore health, a healthy microbiome. And it's this specificity that is really an advantage. So the bacteriophage is going to recognize a particular host. It's going to inject its DNA into the host it will then replicate uh, and it can form many bacteriophage particles from you know, a few to up to thousands. And then it can assemble those particles and lyse the cell. Now, as you already heard from Dr. Chaipati, phages were actually first identified in India at the Ganges River as part of the antibacterial activity. And then they were solidified by Felix de Harel and Frederick Twart, who in the early 1900s purified them and administered the first phage therapies uh, for dysentery of young children. And some of the reason why phage therapy is so essential is that phages are highly specific for their host. Therefore, they leave other bacteria intact. This is very different from antibiotics. When we take an antibiotic, it kills off a lot of our normal microbiota and our healthy microbiota. The second reason that they're very advantageous is that they can multiply and increase in the presence of their host. So even if we give someone a bacteriophage therapy, it can continue to grow as the phage lice the host cells, and it can disappear as the host is gone. It can no longer replicate. So they have a high effective index. Generally speaking, they have a low toxicity and high specificity. But we need to remember that there are a lot of disadvantages to phage therapy as well, so that we can def 
we can make the best phage therapy that we can. And today I wanna to just mention three of the biggest problems and challenges with phage therapy. The first is this narrow specificity for bacterial strains. Although, as I mentioned, it can be advantageous because it can leave the normal healthy microbiota in place, it can also cause problems. Because the phages recognize something on the surface of their host through their tail fibers. The, tip, the top of the tail fiber is usually structural, a structural part of the phage, and the bottom is a specific adhesion that is going to recognize a specific receptor on the surface of a cell. And that can be many different things depending on what the phage is. Everything from proteins to small molecules. And that can trigger entry into the host cell. This high specificity causes a lot of problems because for example, Salmonella typhimerium we know there are thousands of different strains that can be typed by different phages. So when we begin talking about an infection such as a salmonella infection, we can't just go pull any salmonella phage. We have to get a salmonella phage that is specific to the strain that's causing that infection. This can make phage therapy very challenging because it's difficult to make a cocktail that can hit the common, all of the common strains. The second problem is bacterial resistance. So there are many things that we have to do to try to combat bacterial resistance. So when I speak about bacterial resistance, this can occur by many mechanisms, but a common mechanism is for the bacteria to mutate the receptor that the phage is binding to. So it would alter that receptor in some way and then the phage would no longer recognize it and no longer be able to infect. So in order to combat this resistance that bacteria, that bacteria have for bacteriophages, we try to use bacteriophages in phage therapy that are from different families. And here I'm just showing you a phylogenetic tree of bacteria, 60 bacteriophages that we analyzed and the different families that they fall into. So typically we would wanna choose one phage from each family, different families to try to get a cocktail that is very diverse and that the bacteria would have a difficult time becoming resistant to. But it's also important to test this resistance and we can in the laboratory. So one really easy, simple way to test resistance is to plate your bacteria and then just spot down the phage in the middle of the plate. And what will happen is you'll get some resistant bacteria growing in the middle of that spot, that clearing due to the phage. And this occurs over the course of many days. Um, sometimes you have to wait a little while for those resistant bacteria to occur. You can then pick that resistant bacteria and replate it and then spot your phage library individually. So this is being shown five different phages and see if the strain is sensitive to those phages. So here is an example from our laboratory where we were testing five different phages on a resistant strain. And you can see here, there's at least two different resistant patterns. So this, bacterial strain that we isolated as resistant to 266 became resistant to phage 258 and 259. So it became resistant to all three phages. However, it was still sensitive to these two other phages. So uh, when we design a cocktail, we would wanna use, you know, one of these phages with one of these phages uh, in order to try to avoid bacterial resistance since it would be unlikely to be able to develop resistance to several different phages that, that use different resistant mechanisms. Uh, it would be like using a triple antibiotic, multiple antibiotics at once. All right, the third difficulty that I wanna talk about today is transfer of genes to bacteria. And this we really have to worry about. So we commonly think about phage in this lytic cycle, which I already spoke about. In the lytic cycle, 
the phage simply inject their DNA, replicate, and lyse the cell. And some DNA exchange can occur between the host and the phage, even during the lytic cycle. But DNA exchange is even more likely during the lysogenic cycle. Because in the lysogenic cycle, the phage can integrate into the host cell. That's what's being shown here is the integration. And then every time the host cell divides, the phage divides. And only when some sort of signal such as stress uh, is applied to the cell, does the prophage come back out and enter the lytic cycle. So many, many phages, uh, are, they're called temperate phages, are capable of this lysogenic cycle. And some are only capable of the lytic cycle. So when we're designing phage therapy, we like to just choose phages that can do the lytic cycle. But even then, phages can share DNA with their host. So it's very, very important that we are sequencing the phages and characterizing their proteome, the proteins that they encode, because they could be carrying proteins that actually contribute to a problem rather than solve the antibacterial resistance problem. So some examples of that are shown here. This is just a few examples. So each of these bacteria here on the left are actually pathogenic due to a prophage that is inserted into their genome. So they're lysogens and the prophage actually carries the toxin shown here. And that toxin can help cause the diseases that are shown on the right. So this is not something that's extremely rare. We have many, you know, tens of examples. Here's just a few of when a phage is actually contributing to bacterial pathogenicity and contributing to disease. And that's something that we want to avoid. And it's more difficult than it sounds because it's very difficult to prove that a phage is just lytic. We may not have the conditions correct in the lab to detect the lysogenic cycle. And so it's very, very key that we begin to understand phage genomes. And this is a extremely daunting task. As Dr. Chaipati said, there are 10 to the 31 phages on the planet. That's a lot of phages. And there's extreme diversity in phages. So what I'm showing you here are four different phage genomes from one of our publications. And what I've done here is I've colored all the proteins that are present in other phages with a color. Um, this is a ruler which we're using to just as a cartoon of the phage genome. And the boxes are the different proteins that are encoded. And if they're colored, that means they're found in another phage genome. And if they're not colored, they're completely unique to that phage. We haven't found another phage that has them. So you can see that we can identify phages that are extremely unique and don't have other proteins in common with other phages. And they can be very, very difficult to characterize. And in fact, on average for most of our phage genomes, even when they do have proteins in common with other phages, half of the proteins have unknown function. So it's, it's very difficult to ensure that a phage is safe when we don't know what half of its proteins do. And this is a huge, huge challenge in phage therapy. And we need good ways uh, for identifying protein function and determining that function. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. And I'm going to be talking about six different ways that we are using in my laboratory to try to determine protein function and uncover that. So the first I wanna talk about is RNA-seq or transcriptional timing. This can be really, really telling for the function of a phage. Protein. So here's just an overview of what RNA-seq is. So for RNA-seq of a bacteriophage, what we would do is take samples at various time points in a phage life cycle so that we're trying to see what proteins are involved at the beginning for injection of the DNA and what phage proteins might be involved for transcription and DNA replication, what phage genes might be involved for assembly and lysis, and then we isolate the RNA 
and sequence. And then we can map that back. The great thing is if we use a lysate, we can map the RNAs back to not only the phage genome, but also the bacterial genome. So we can also see what bacteria genes is the phage inducing. And that is really powerful because the phage often does induce certain genes from the bacteria. So we're not only learning about the phage, but we're learning about the bacteria and the infection process as well. So I just wanna go into a little bit more detail on this quickly. So when I'm talking about the steps, there are a lot more steps than the simple diagram I gave you. And this is even simplified, which I'll show you on the next slide. But first we have injection of the DNA, which certain proteins are involved in. And then there's viral protein synthesis, which can be you know, anywhere from 15 to 60 different proteins that help build the virion. There's DNA replication that occurs. Here I'm show, showing rolling circle replication, which is common. And then there can be proteins next that are involved in the procapsid assembly. So uh, getting the procapsid, the empty capsid ready for injecting DNA and assembling the tell. Once those are assembled, the phage capsids can be packaged with DNA and then finally, the whole phage can be assembled. So the tails get attached to the heads and the cell can lice. So we could have proteins that are working at each of these different steps and they're going to be expressed at different times within the host cell. So if we do very careful timing and collection of RNA, we can begin to map where those proteins are working. Here is an example from King, King and Kikuchi who actually determined the tell assembly pathway. And they determine that it's very, very obligately ordered. So these proteins get expressed in a certain order and they work together to build the different parts, oh, excuse me, the different parts of the tell and put the base plate and the tell together. So this is just an example of how, how complex it is, but if we take those time points, we can begin to see the expression of these proteins vary. So as a concept, uh, we did just a few time points with this phage that's called Jello. This was isolated by one of my undergraduate students and I let them name their phages whatever they want. So sometimes the phages end up crazy names. In fact, we have a phage named YOLO swag. So, you know, it's, it's difficult to write scientific papers when you have really crazy phage names, but it's pretty fun too. So this, this phage is actually pretty unique. It only has 15 of 64 genes that have a putative function. And so what we did was first, we determined what we call a burst curve or a one-step growth curve for the bacteriophage. So we simply infect the host cell, the bacteria, and we titer for phage at time points after that. And we can see the when the phage, what we call the burst happens. So the cells are being lysed and phage is being released at a huge rate. So what we would assume is that first the phage is attaching it's doing its DNA trans replication, transcription, and translation. It's assembling the phage and then bursting the, the cell. And what we have done as a proof of concept is just take time points at 0, 15, 25, and 35 minutes to see are these good time points for trying to determine the function of proteins. And then you can actually delve from this even more. You could take time points every five minutes or even every two to three minutes to see how the RNA is changing. But I'll just give you a brief example of what we found from these four initial time points. From these initial time points, we then take the RNA and we used Illumina technology to sequence. And I, I just wanna throw out a few key pointers here. One difficulty with RNA-seq is that if you buy a kit for making a library, and we usually make our own libraries because it's just cheaper <laughs> for sequencing. Um, but if you buy a kit to make a library, usually they're for eukaryotic cells. So usually the first step in these kits 
is actually to purify RNA by binding to oligo T. And that's because eukaryotic mRNAs have a poly A tell, right? So they're gonna bind to this oligo DT and you can easily purify the mRNA. So if you use a standard kit, it is not gonna work for your bacteria and your phage because they do not have poly A tells and your RNA will not be purified and enriched through this process. And so you need to use, there are kits available that um, have allowed you to purify the mRNA and do 16S rRNA depletion. So what, why you can't just use the RNA straight is that the most abundant RNA that is produced is of course the ribosomal RNA. And if you don't get rid of that, that's all you will see when you sequence is ribosomal RNA. So you have to deplete that and get rid of the ribosomal RNA. You can then, in a kit like Illumina's, we use their first strand synthesis kit. Now, what's really cool about this kit is it not only gives you the RNAs that are made, but it tells you what strand it came from, the top or the bottom DNA strand. Um, and this is just really, really valuable in many cases, especially with the unknown, the proteins of unknown function, or if you're having difficulty in annotating your genome. So the first strand synthesis, this does, uh, uses actinomycin to inhibit DNA templated synthesis. So basically it takes the RNA and it makes only one strand of DNA and it, it inhibits that DNA from being used as a template. So it won't make copies off of that. And then in the kit, it replaces TTP um, with UTP to quench the second strand. So the second strand is now labeled and then you can sequence and you can know what strand the RNA came from, was coded from. So when we did this with Jello, we got some really, really exciting results. All but one of our predicted mRNAs was detected. So we had detected, we had predicted that 64 gene products would be made by this phage just from looking at the DNA and annotating it. And we were able to see 63 of those 64 gene products, which was remarkable. And if we look early on at 15 minutes, only six of them is expressed. And at 25 minutes, 26 of them becomes expressed. And at 35 minutes, 62 are expressed. And so this is really, really useful. And what we're do doing now is just going every five minutes to get a more detailed look at when these genes are expressed and give us a better idea of what they're involved in. But it, it, this is working because if we take, I told you there's, there's 15 gene products with known function. And if we take the results for those 15 gene products with known function, they fall right where we would expect them to fall in the expression timing. So we got early, 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 early expression of genes involved in assembly, the pro-head protease, the tel-assembly proteins, and also genes involved in DNA replication. Uh, so it was really, really exciting um, because then we could see everything progress at different time points with the later time points, including assembly and lysis being at the 65 minutes. So these numbers are just the number of proteins that showed up at those time points and we were able to verify. So we had quite a few at the beginning um, and a few at the end that had known function. But the point is that their functions and their timing were perfectly aligned which allowed us to verify that this, this process of RNA-seq works. And this it has been done in several publications online that you can see for several different phages. The really interesting thing too, is that you get information about expression. So we could look at the signal to see how high the RNA level was likely in that sample. 
And we can see that a majority of the proteins, including even the, the RNA encoding the major caps of protein, the terminase, the tail proteins, um, DNA replication proteins were down uh, at a pretty low expression level, but several proteins of unknown function had super, super high expression levels. And we're really interested in determining what those do and looking more closely at the timing of those proteins. All right, so that is the first one, RNA sequencing, which, which can be really pow powerful for helping to understand the protein function. The second one is a much simpler method, which, I, which is called protein structure prediction. So many times, even though there's no homology by blast between two proteins, they can still form a similar structure when they assemble. And so what you can do is actually feed your sequences through a program to predict the structure and see if it's similar to any other protein structures because proteins with related structure often have related function. So it can give you an idea of what the function is. And here's just an example from one of our publications. This was actually done by an undergraduate, Jordan Berg, who was phenomenal. So what Jordan did was he noticed that in this family of phages, uh, we had a whole bunch of proteins that were homologous to one another. So we could align them and they had um, high identity. They weren't identical, but they had high identity and we didn't know what this protein did. So he fed it through protein structure prediction programs. And there's many free programs online like Raptor X, HHPred. There's, there's a bunch that you can use. And we were able to see that it actually had homology. It was a much bigger protein. And some of it, the program couldn't fold for us. You can see there's a lot of region here that's just straight amino acid sequence. It couldn't predict the folding, but it could predict this region that was similar to the P22 um, C2 repressor. So a DNA transcriptional regulator that um, repressed expression. And so we then thought, oh, our protein is probably a transcriptional regulator. And from there, the pocket of, of the C2 repressor, the DNA binding pocket was well known and well characterized. So that allowed us to look at the DNA binding pocket of our proteins, and we could begin to guess the DNA sequence that it would bind to and regulate through the program. As I mentioned, Raptor X is what we used. And then you can go back to the genome and look at what genes this particular transcriptional regulator might be regulating by looking for the consensus DNA sequence that it binds to. So there's just an example of, uh, this is much easier. It doesn't require any wet lab work, right? You, you're just feeding all your unknown proteins in your genome through a program to predict the protein structure and seeing if structural alignment will give you an idea of a function. The third method that we've tried is mass spectrometry. And this can predict virion proteins. So just really quickly, I think this one's pretty simple and straightforward. We basically take a phage lysate, so grow it up on the host, and then we run it through a gradient such as a cesium chloride gradient so that we can separate the phage particles from particles from the bacteria and other contaminants. What you can see when you run a cesium chloride gradient, you've put your sample on the top and then centrifuged, you can see discrete bands and you have to check and see which one is your phage. So you can, you can puncture the tube and take a sample out from the tube. In fact, I'm gonna to switch to my pen so I could show you this. Let's say this one was, we wanted to see what was there. We can actually puncture the tube and with a syringe, get that sample. We can see if that's our phage by either looking under the electron microscope or doing a plaque assay. We then take whichever sample was our phage and we subject it to trypsin digesting fragmentation and then um, liquid chromatography mass spectrometry. So LCMS, MS, and we can see the proteins that make up part of the capsid or the virion. 
So an example of this is in a paper by a wonderful PhD student from India, Ruchir Sharma, who took a family of phages, uh, Ray and Demos Minion, and she performed mass spectrometry on the lysate. And as a control, she was able, as you can see here, to detect many of the proteins that were already just by blast um, comparison were already predicted to be structural proteins. But in addition to those structural proteins, she was able to detect 27, not all of them are shown here, hypothetical proteins. So proteins we had no clue what their function was. And now we know that they're part of the virion. They make, they make up part of the phage virion since they were present in that mass spectrometry sample. All right, so the fourth method that uh, we've never, we haven't published on a phage yet for this, but we have published many two hybrid methods, not on phage. And it's a really, really powerful method for determining a more precise function. If you wanna know exactly what a protein is doing, the bacterial to hybrid can work really, really well. So I'll give you an example of this, but first I wanna introduce you to the concept. So this is a bunch of BYU students, right? And if we wanted to know what a person did, if we wanted to know more about one single person, if we knew who they interacted during the day, we could know a lot about who they were and what they did. For example, you know, if I just wanted to know something about one of these students and I didn't know anything about them, but I knew that they hung around these other students that were BYU students, I would figure, oh, it's probably a BYU student. So just by knowing something about the proteins that hang out with our protein of interest, we can begin to understand it and its function. So the way that the bacterial to hybrid works is based off of a enzyme called uh, adenylate cyclase, and it has two domains. From this company, Euromedics, uh, which has the system from this paper right here, they devised a plan to use this enzyme and they call one domain T25 and the other domain of the protein T18. So normally these two domains are just one polypeptide chain, one protein. But what they've done is actually cleave it in half and express it from two different plasmids. And now this enzyme can't function because those two parts or pieces of the enzyme don't come together and it's not active. However, you, what we do is we actually clone a phage protein into the plasmid to create a fusion protein with half of this adenylate cyclase. And we close a bacterial protein or library and fuse it to T18. And then we can introduce both plasmids into the cell and we can see, do they interact? Because in theory, if these two proteins interact, it will bring together the two pieces of adenylate cyclase and allow cyclic AMP to be made, which you can select for. And if the, those cells grow on the plate, then those interacted and it allowed for functional adenylate cyclase. Then we can sequence what that bacterial protein was by purifying the plasmids or performing PCR so the total steps are to make the libraries of the phage, the different proteins of the phage, and you have to make a library of the bacterial host by cloning them into the two plasmids, either for the T25 or the T18, and then introducing those plasmids into the bacterial cell and selecting for the cyclic AMP activity one can then purify the plasmids or run PCR and sequence, and you can know what protein your particular protein can interact with. And this is, as I mentioned, very, very powerful because you have a pathway and proteins that your protein is working with. And it's a very good method for getting at a precise function. Another really beneficial method is suppressor screens. 
These can also help you predict a more precise function through complementation or suppression. So what you have to start with here is you need to have a bacterial collection. Uh, this can be a collection of knockouts that don't grow well, or I have a collection of what we call temperature sensitive mutations in the salmonella genome that was very generously given to me by Molly Schmidt and Anka Siegel. So if you have a bacterial collection where it's been mutated so that the bacteria can't grow well, then you can once again select for phage proteins that can restore the growth of that bacteria. And in this way, if you know what mutation the original bacteria had, you know what function the suppressor, the phage protein might have because it's able to rescue it or complement it. So in this experiment, what we do is we take that bacterial strain or collection of strains that do not grow well. We then introduce uh, the, a library of the phage genome, once again, cloned onto plasmids and then we plate and we select for growth. And then we can take any colonies that grow up, we can perform PCR or uh, purify the plasmid and then sequence and see what phage gene from this library allowed growth of that particular strain. And in this way, we can see what phage genes will complement the bacterial deficiency and allow growth. And, and come to a conclusion on its function. So we've been talking about these five different ways for identifying protein function. And I just wanna remind you how important this is for ensuring that our phages are safe for phage therapy. But I also want to speak to the people who are interested in just basic science, understanding phages for basic research. I think this is invaluable because phages, there's 10 to the 31 of them. They're highly diverse. Many that we purify and isolate have no homology to any other form of life. So they are going to be our largest pool of proteins by far. And they're going to give us the di most diverse functions. And some of these proteins functions can be extremely useful in biotechnology. I'm just gonna give a few examples like Lambda Red, the recombinase system from Lambda was identified you know, 30, 25, 30 years ago and has been extremely useful for modifying bacterial genomes by boosting the recombination rate. The CRISPR system, right? More recently identified in, in bacteria through doing phage work uh, is now used to even make human mutations and mouse mutations. So as we begin to really understand and characterize these unknown proteins of phages, they can become very useful for in basic research as well. So I thank you very much for inviting me today. We've talked about a few of the problems and the best practices for phage therapy, right? We should all aim for getting the right specificity for our bacterial strains, trying to target a wide range of pathogens for a particular disease. We should definitely check the bacterial resistance, ensuring that the bacteria cannot gain resistance to our phages easily. And then of course, I think the most challenging of these by far is to understand that phage genome to ensure that we're not transferring uh, pathogenic genes to the bacterial hosts. Now, in conclusion, I would very much like to thank the committee who invited me to speak today and specifically to Runa Anand, who I've begun to work with and I'm excited to continue collaborating with. And I thank you very much. I'd like to thank the BYU Phage Hunter students um, I have now trained, actually that should be changed to over 400 students who hunt every year for bacteriophages. We have isolated hundreds that are in our collection. Uh, uh, over a hundred of them are on GenBank. And these undergraduate students have been authors on 10 scientific manuscripts. 
The other phage work comes directly from my laboratory. And this is a picture of several of the students in my laboratory. Today, I spoke about research done by Jordan Berg and Ruchira Sharma, who were undergraduate and PhD students in my laboratory. I'd also like to thank my many collaborators, just a few key ones are shown here. Sandra Hope and Don Breckwell at BYU helped me with the BYU Phage Hunters program and instituted it. Richard Robison, Steve Johnson, Don and Jonathan Hill all at BYU collaborate with me on my phage research. And Dr. Sherwood Kastians is a renowned phage biologist who has actually very kindly continued to mentor me and train me throughout the years. David Baltris is a generous collaborator at the University of Arizona. And we've had funding for our phage projects through many different organizations, including the IR4, the USDA, and of course, Brigham Young University itself, who's been a huge support of our phage hunters program, as well as several private investors. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. That was a really uh, enlightening and wonderful talk. Like we never thought that proteome is so important. Everybody is nowadays about like genome and genome. And uh, you have told me the right way, like how we can proceed for the proteome analysis and we can really dig out many more novel proteins when we see the proteome uh, encoded by the bacteriophages. So I really thank, uh, thank you for uh, giving this enlightening talk. Um, I think now there are a few questions that have come up in the chat, chat box. Uh, as we see on the YouTube, there are a few questions and queries. So I would uh, uh, pass them on to you to uh, have your view. So the first question is from Sarita. Uh, she says that, is it not a genomics approach which is the best one to study the phage proteome? So what would you like to say about it? Uh, genomics approach is, uh, I, I'm not quite sure. It's, that's kind of a large, a large open area. Of course, when we first annotate, the first thing we do is blast, right? We blast. And we see, does our protein have any homology to any other protein? And that's basic annotation. That's done first. What I'm talking about is all the proteins that have no blast hit, or they have a blast hit to something of unknown function. And that's very, very common. Yeah. Even we see that uh, 60 to 70% of the phage genomes, they encode for hypothetical proteins and we are really uh, confused like uh, uh, which, which do they address to, like what is their role in the phage replication and why do they at all exist there? That's so, right. I mean, some phages have three or 400 proteins and, and you know, 80 or 90% of them are hypothetical. It, it's just overwhelming. Yeah, exactly. So the next question is that, uh, there is, a, uh, this question is from Atif. Um, he says that uh, I have kept water samples from River Ganga since last eight months at room temperature. What could be the bacteria and bacteriophage profile if I will analyze it today? Maybe you can- That's great. Yes, there are many kits available now for sequencing what we would call a dirty sample like that, right? So you, you haven't purified the bacteria, you haven't purified the phage, and there are several metagenomic kits that you can just isolate all the DNA and sequence and see what's there. And it, that would be fabulous if, if you have the opportunity to do that. You could see a wide variety, I'm sure, of both bacteria and phages that are still present in those samples. So uh, the next question is uh, that uh, he wants to know uh, any method to identify a unique phage without sequencing. Oh, that's a great question. I, I, I like that question. Um, we are really interested in the unique phages that are out there. Uh, 
some of the things that you can do to get a more unique phage is to unique use unique techniques when um, purifying, when identifying the phage. So one thing that we switched to that you might want to try is using different top auger. So we found that standard top auger doesn't allow some of the very large bacteriophages to grow. It's just too concentrated. And if you switch your top auger, say cut the auger in the recipe to one half, it can be a pain because it, it won't solidify now in 20 or 30 minutes. Yeah. It can take an hour. To, it can take an hour to solidify, but you will find very large phages if you do that. Uh, um, we found many very, very large phages. So these phages that are over 200,000 base pairs, um, some of them over 300,000 base pairs, and they have a huge proteome. And usually our larger phages are really unique because less people are doing that. Less people are using the diluted top auger. So you can have really unique methods. Yeah. I have a question. So when you have these big phages, so what kind of filter you use? Do you use 0.45 micron? Because otherwise they might block it to those big phages. Yeah, you can use 0.45 micron. We actually don't use a filter at all. So what we do, yeah, is we're just centrifuging our lysates much, much longer and then um, treating the lysate with chloroform to get rid of residual bacteria. And because we found we were losing a lot of phages, even if they're not large, using filters, a lot of phages will bind to, to filters. Uh, I have a question. Uh, if uh, in one phage we are able to see both lytic as well as lysogenizing uh, genes, and that phage is a very good um, uh, lytic phage on some of the bacteria, uh, but because of the other genes, we are not able to really use it for the fear of, you know, uh, getting it integrated into bacterial cell. So is there any ways of doing gene editing and uh, actually using this phage and removing the lysogenizing genes from there? Uh, how yes, do we go sir. about We don't want to lose this phage. It's a precious yeah. phage for us. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I understand completely. Um, there was a very recent phage therapy case uh, in Europe, where they used mycobacteria phage, um, where they edited actually uh, the, the phage to take the tail fiber from a temperate phage and move it into a lytic, a purely lytic phage. Uh, so that's one method. You can change the tail fiber of the phage so that uh, you can now infect a different host. Or you, some people have also just using uh, gene replacement, CRISPR editing, or, or the Lambda Red system, you can knock out some of the key genes required for lysogeny, including the integrase, so that it can no longer integrate into the bacterial genome. Okay. Great question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there is another question from Gunik Chin. Uh, in he, it is regarding the yeast two hybrid system that you have told in your talk. So he says that is it possible for phage protein to obscure the active site of the adenylate cyclase, hence introducing a false negative error? Absolutely. So that's another great question. One thing we always do when we perform the two hybrid, uh, you, and you can use either the bacterial two hybrid system or the yeast two hybrid system, either one. But one of the things that you must do is once you have a protein, a colony growing up, you must isolate the, the plasmid back out and then put that plasmid back in to the bacteria alone. And that way you'll know, you know, without the, uh, without the second plasmid, if it allows growth by itself, it's a false positive. So it's pretty easy to determine the false positives in that way, because we always purify the plasmid back out anyway and retest growth just to make sure that it's dependent on our plasmid. So uh, this is another question for, uh, from Swati. She's from India. When bacteriophage is having efficiency in wastewater treatment, 
why it is not widely used in wastewater treatment plant to reduce the toxicity range of wastewater. Yeah, absolutely. Bacteriophages are starting to be used to treat wastewater here in the United States. I, I'm uncertain about India, how much they're being used there. Somebody else might be able to answer that better than me. Professor Vinod works on that. Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. He has, he has shown. Yeah, I, I know you're, you're working on that. I didn't know how widely it was used, but uh, I think it will be used more and more in the future. It, it can be a really powerful and safer method for treating water. Yes, thank you. Now, there is another question from Dheeraj. He wants to know about uh, like, uh, can we spray bacteriophages for uh, uh, bacterial diseases in plants? Fabulous question. We actually have developed a phage therapy for treating fire blight, which is a caused by the bacteria Erwinia and it infects apple trees, uh, peach tree, pear trees, almond trees. And it's been shown to be very useful. In the US, we, there's also been companies that have released phage therapies for tomatoes uh, tomato plants and pepper plants. There are several now that are in use in agriculture. So for sure, there are some papers also, they are coming up now for the use and application in plants actually. Huh? So, and there is another question uh, by uh, Dr. Urmi student, Dr. K. Enyan. So uh, he wants to ask that uh, some bacteriophage which infect E. coli, they have a very short life cycle of 50 minutes of lit five minutes of latency before it bursts the cell. So is it possible to trap and isolate RNA and do RNA sequence for such phages? Means for those phages which are having very small uh, latency, latency period. Yeah, it is. There are some very quick, um, quick multiplying bacteriophages, right? Some that can multiply in as fast as 20 minutes. And you would just want to take much shorter time points, like maybe one, every one minute, take a time point. Mm -hmm. There is another question that uh, what, um, uh, this is from Dr. Ritam Das, what would be best way to characterize the hypothetical proteins which do, do not show any similarity to known proteins. Also, how can we characterize proteins that are toxic to the host? Yeah, some great, great questions. So let's answer the first one. Um, I, I've talked about five different methods and you asked which one is the best. And really there isn't a best method because they all have advantages and disadvantages. Like the RNA-seq, it can give you uh, information about the whole entire proteome at once. So that is valuable because you're looking at a lot of different genes at once. However, something like the bacterial two hybrid or the suppressor screen can give you more precise function because you know the proteins it's interacting with and the, the pathways that it's interacting with. So some can give you a lot more precise. For sure, the cheapest one and the easiest one is the structural comparison. Okay. And um, another question is uh, like when bacteriophage is having, uh, sorry, uh, another question is that can we use PCR to differentiate different phage types targeting specific sequences? Absolutely. I, if I could show you example research articles where they've done that. So one of the earlier questions was, you know, how can I find a novel phage? Um, some people working on mycobacteriophage because there've been so many phages isolated there. They've designed primers against each of the families of mycobacteriophages that are known so far. And I wish I could think of the author's names right now. I'm just having a brain, <laughs> brain block. And they, um, they can, it allows you to run PCR on plaques that you get and see, oh, is, does this belong to one of the families that's already known? Or is this a more unique and novel phage? 
they, if they oh. have a conserved region in the tape measure protein. Yeah, yeah, often they use the tape measure, but you can simply do an alignment of the genome. Usually the major capsid protein is also really highly, highly conserved. So the major capsid protein is a good place to go as well. Um, these were the questions that participants had asked and uh, we are really thankful to Julian to clarify their doubts. Julian, no, I have a no. question. Yes, oh, sir. Great. Uh, I have a certain question. Now, Gopal Nath is there to ask certain questions. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, so, Dr. Julian, a very wonderful talk. You know? Thank you. But, uh, but, your, but your talks have really frightened us. You, know? you cannot, cannot use the, 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 the procure-fast therapy without you know, knowing his protein profile and other <laughs> things. It's very difficult, you know. And, and especially when you go for the internal medicine of therapy, so when you use this for therapy for parental route, then perhaps it is going inside the body and then it might be interacting with uh, so, so many systems and the entire system biology is to, uh, I mean, come in action. So without having known the genomics or the proteomics, we really we cannot go for, for any kind of therapy as, as per, per your talk. I agree. It's a, it's a really big, big challenge. And yeah. of course, we do phage therapy all the time with phages that have unknown pr proteins of unknown function, right? We, because it takes a long time to fully understand even one, one bacteria phage. But I think yeah. it's important that we try to understand as much as we can. One thing that can help us ensure that phages are safe is where we're pulling them from. Because if, let, let's say for human phage therapy, we um, look at the human phageome and we say, okay, what phages are commonly found in healthy individuals? Because we find them commonly in healthy individuals, they should in theory be safe for, for phage therapy. That, that's, you know, I think a, an easier way right now to make, a good estimate that the phage is safe. Uh, of course, you know, it would be great to combine that with a full understanding of the proteome, but that is going to take a lot of time. Mm -hmm. Is there any group in the world who are working on the immunology of fast therapy? Have... Any, any, any group the immunology? Working? Yes, there's, there's many, many people. In fact, the National Institute of Health here um, just put out a huge grant opportunity for people working on the immunology. The of immunology, of, immunology of bacterial fast therapy. What? Sorry. Uh, I'd like to know that if there were a group working in the USA on immunology of bacterial fast therapy. Yes. Yeah, there are there, there are actually many groups working on it. Um, we are just trying to actually publish a paper on phage therapy of a sea turtle where we looked a little bit at the immunology. So uh, I think there's, there's quite a few groups working on it now and you'll see more and more papers come out in the very, very near future. Do you, yeah, do, but so do, far, do you feel that, do you feel that in chronic infection, we, when we repeatedly give this fast, fast therapy, yeah, it can cause resistance also, or it, or it may not be effective at all because of development of antibody against bacteria. Yeah, it's it's difficult to know, and every phage is going to. I'm sure what these studies are going to show, because the initial studies have that every phage has a very different stability in the human body or in an animal body, right? Some some are going to pretty much immediately be filtered out of the system and not be stable and others might be stable for days or weeks. We've seen some that are stable for weeks after administration. So it's going to take, unfortunately, that type of research is going to have to be done phage by phage because it appears that there's a lot of variability in, in the stability and inside of, inside of an animal. Well, thank you. Thank you, thank you for good talk. Thank, thank you, you very you. much for inviting me. This was a pleasure. Yeah, yeah thank you. It was thank very, you. very beautiful, very yeah. wonderful talk. Very, very enlightening. Really, it was. Yeah. Now we yeah. have uh, uh, Dr. Gopala joined, uh, but uh, he was uh, silently listening to the talk. 
now <laughs> he is the secretary of uh, society for uh, bacteriophage research and therapy and he is doing wonderful work on uh, phage therapy in humans in india so i invite him for uh, 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 an official uh, vote of thanks please sir thank you very much taruna actually uh, it's really a great pleasure to be to perform such a nice uh, duty and i like it every time and I, i am really grateful to julian gross to be here and also all the family members of the sbrt are here and before i am telling anything i would request dr bn tripathi to hold a conference because uh, dr uh, rama <laughs> choudhury is doing uh, means uh, the, the virtual one aims and, uh, and the asm uh, she is organizing the uh, second week of the october but the when the corona goes away then something you have to do i think you'll be doing that one and then uh, i it's really great to see the all the members here dr chibber dr urmi dr taruna and others are there many uh, participants are there uh, it was spell bound uh, lecture by the julian actually and being a, actually i am the application part i i do see the application part of the vector phase therapy and uh, about this chronic infection and the uh, Uh, this uh, neutralizing appearance of neutralizing antibody all these things we have worked in the rabbits and we have found that usually the antibodies are right rising after the use of the bacteriophage cocktail usually third after third week so if the acute infection is there that will take that takes care but if the chronic infection is there you have to check you have to take the antigenically different lytic phages so we must have to have the uh, this uh, library of the phages the other thing we have seen recently that we have given 10 power 15 and 10 power 20 vector phages orally to the rat model just to see that what is the implication of the oral administration to these animals and we found no change nothing as dr julian has said very rightly that the these phages are basically part of the microbiome a gut uh, flora and these uh, human viruses the vector phages and the bacteria all those are there and probably they are inducing very less uh, immune response and they are the part of that they are recognized by they are not recognized by our immune system as a foreign body so that advantage we are going to take the other thing being uh, application part of the phase therapist it was really interesting to have these five approaches of knowing the unknown proteins and it was really interesting for me because we see everything in a gross way and vector phases are very dynamic every cycle they are they may acquire some gene from the host bacteria so it is really very difficult to characterize all the phages so probably we have to take risk and the regulatory bodies have to permit us for this to take these risks so we have just to use the cocktail of the phages and just see the adverse effect the uh, the severe adverse effect or other toxic effects and then they have we have to go for this because naturally we are having the bacteria in our um uh, this gut flora and skin flora everywhere on the mucosa surfaces where the bacteria are there so uh, it was really interesting for me i think that we should try on the mass spectrophotometry after um, this uh, fractionation of the phases it was really interesting and maybe i am going to try because after this uh, illuminating lecture of the julian so once again i am um, thankful to dr taruna and especially dr urmi every time they are taking great pain to organize such beautiful lectures and we are really during this corona war time uh, the, we are uh, they are sparing time and doing this thing we all are busy in making a lot of diagnoses and all those detections we are doing in our lab so i think in future also uh, julian will be helping us giving all these things whatever she is doing there and we will be will be feel lucky to have a collaboration with her in future also and uh, once again thanks to all of you and a special thanks to dr julian gross thank you thank you so much thank yeah, you thank you thank you, thank you. Uh, there are a lot of uh, feedbacks like uh, the talk was very informative it was very inspiring and thanks and very encouraging so we are really overwhelmed by the uh, participants that they have uh, uh, joined this session this webinar and uh, they are the actual uh, ones who have made this uh, uh, means who always make these kind of webinars a success so i would really like to thank all the participants and uh, uh, would seek uh, um, uh, my means uh, their support 
and uh, sir, uh, I really thank Dr. Tripathi sir, Dr. Gopalna, Dr. Sanjay Chibber sir, sir, you are doing excellent work we know in India. And uh, Dr. Julian, Dr. Urmi, a special thanks to you. And uh, yeah, and uh, uh, thank you all. Maybe we join again sometime later. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Great. Bye. Dr. Rama, madam, also. Sorry, ma'am, I could not see your picture is not visible. So, okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, you, madam, thank for you. joining. Thank you, one, thank you. one and all. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Yes. 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 Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, thank you, sir. Nice to meet you. Thank you.